to our uh, painting estimate. This is a uh, the same project we were working on for uh, the demo uh, framing drywall. Now we're going to do the paint. And so what we're looking at here is the reflective ceiling plan because that's going to show us or help us we will use this plan to determine how many square feet of uh, ceiling we have to paint. Now let's see if I've printed out everything. Probably not for this one. For some reason this isn't printing. So we're just going to write it out. And now that I've mastered pause on the recorder, that's what we're going to do. All right. So. We're going to put together this painting estimate and when we think about a painting estimate we think about the ceiling paint wall paint uh, door paint door trim because that's a different uh, labor rate for trim as opposed to a straight area and when we think about the doors uh, we have the labor for the doors that we got from the cost book, but if we go by square feet, uh, typical doors, what, three by seven, and then you have to do both sides, and, well, they say a door has six sides, and so we just go by the cost book, and we'll go over that. Door trim, so ceiling, walls, door trim, and then it had some other wall trim on this one, and so we did the takeoff already. What we're looking at is the ceiling, and so... I think all of the ceiling was painted P1 or whatever, but we'll look at it. And so we have this. Let's take this pan hand off. So we can do our square feet. So the main ceiling was 788. We'll just say 788. And then we had the back of the house, which is, we'll say that's plus 1. 60 what was that eight we always round up and then the bathroom was 52 we're not using that up okay so we've got 788 plus 168 plus 52 we have a thousand eight And now for the walls, we use the uh, interior elevations, which is real easy. So we have back of the house. And so uh, what it should give you, right, a room has four sides. So this is cutting. It's not the best of interior elevation, but I know that's what they want you to use because it's telling you the paint co color you know, for the walls, and so this is the interior. And so for the back of the house and the bathroom is P3. And for the main showroom area was a P1. So that's that one. And then the other side of the of the building. And this is the storefront. We did that separately. And that's the back of the house. And then the other part of the back of the house. And then we got that. And then we didn't include the door. And then this is the back of the house. The full measure of the back of the house. And so... They give you the elevations. It's kind of funky, but that's what we're going to use. And so, for this is uh, for the wall paint. And then did I do, so for the doors, we're just going to use, I think we had two doors. That's all we had was two doors. All right, so let's go to the main estimating tab and do all of our paints. We did everything. We're going to come back and do a miscellaneous for uh, uh, for 
uh, flooring and wall base. So right here we're just doing. See, we had to paint the awning frame. So that's the additional trim. So we're just going to put, I think I did that, awning frame right here. It's 13 feet. And didn't I say times two? No, we'll just say 13 feet. And then <clears throat> the storefront base had a storefront base. When you have a bad set of plans, it takes forever. Storefront base was, did I just see it? 37 square feet. And that's the trim, cladding, vinyl, da, 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 paint. Here we go. P1 we had all together from the interior elevation. So that would be the wall. P1 is, because I like to break it down, because when we win, we have to actually buy each of the different paints, right? And then P3, I believe uh, the ceiling was P1. P3 is 8. 875 square feet. And then the ceiling, which was also P1. I did that already. It's 1,080. So we'll add that to P1. I mean, 1,008. It's 15, 6, 0, 2,065. Okay. Let's see. Let's make sure we have. And then we have two doors. We had the additional trim. And, and remember, when we do these cost estimates based on nothing, uh, we just do the best we can. And then once we win, we go back and <laughs> with a fine tooth comb and fix everything. All right. So let's go back to... But what I want to show you the most is how we uh, determine how much paint we need. So let's get the estimate. Here it is, all filled in, ready to go. Today's not the 17th, it's actually the 27th. <clears throat> all right, so we said we had wall. So this is our labor, and we are going to, it's assumed three coats. So that's our man hour unit. This is actually times three. Okay, so it uh, this is the labor times three, right? Because we have to do a primer and two uh, finish coats. But how do I know this? Because I have a cost book that tells me that. I'm not just guessing, okay? So, and uh, the cost books are based on industry standard, just like when you are equated to when you go to the mechanic, right? They look in the book and they say it's going to take an hour and a half, even though it takes them like 30 minutes. But they still, according to the standard, are able to charge you an hour and a half. Same thing here. So we just go by industry standards when it comes to the man hour unit. So you got to make sure you have a good cost book and not your uncle. <laughs> He's not a cause book. All right. So that's why we win. All right. Walls. So we said we had how many walls? Oh, okay. We said we had, I did that with the paint. So all of the walls together is 10, 57. That was P1 wall. And then plus P3 wall was. 875 yeah so that's 1932 okay so that's 1932 that's square feet it's a tiny job right and then the ceiling is that we don't have a deck, so let's take that. We always reuse estimates. 
from the previous one. And we had two doors. And wall trim. We had. That was that. Oh, wait. I didn't count that. This was this wall trim. Where did it go? <laughs> Storefront. This one. No, this one. This wall trim. Around the windows. The window trim. So that would be 135 feet. Yeah, that's 135 feet for that window trim. <clears throat> so let's go back. I said wall, but it's window. Because trim. As you can see, has a different uh, labor rate than walls. Or than walls. 0.15. Okay, so I said 135 linear feet. That knocks it up pretty wide. And then that, <coughs> that base was 37 square feet and door frames we have two door frames oh so it's uh 21 feet 21 linear feet per door yeah because it's 77 it's 14 right both sides and then the top is three is that what I said? Yeah. 14, 17 per door, both sides, that's 34. Then you have two doors, that's 68. All right, do it again. Both sides, seven and seven for the sides, that's 14. Plus three for the top, that's 17. Do both sides, that's 34. And then we have two doors. That's 68. Okay, now. We are going to do, let's see. Ceiling will break the, da, 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 we'll break everything down. So primer is everything, right? So we have to prime everything. We even have the primer. We, we just put the primer for everything. Now, for the two doors, right, it's 3 by 7, 21. So a door is 42 square feet, and I have two doors, so that's 84 square feet for the two doors. Okay, so now we have to see how much primer, and we assume always with our paint, and we could go a little lower for custom homes or whatever, but for commercial, we assume that one gallon gives us 400 square feet, okay, for the purpose of our estimates, and so for primer, Get the old handy dandy calculator. We have to 1932 plus 1008 plus what did I say for the doors? 84 plus 84 plus we just do the linears as if they're square feet because you gotta, you know, you're going around them, you give yourself a little extra. Plus, I don't know if I did plus already, I'm gonna have to do this again. Plus 135. Uh, plus 37, then plus 68. So that's 3,254. Let's do it again. 1932 plus 1,008 plus the doors, which was 84 plus 135 plus 37 plus 68, 3264. <clears throat> so for primer, right, divide by 400. Make sure I wrote that down so I don't mess it up. So we, oops, I messed it up. 3264 divided by 400. So 8.16. So for primer, we're just going to say we need 9. And for the walls, Right, 
we have the walls. So for the walls, it's different, right? The, we're going to say, because we need two of those, right? For the primer, we only needed one coat. But for everything else, we need two coats. And so if we do for these walls, we need two coats, which is... 19 so we're going to do them separately so for the walls we have walls here 1932 all right 1932 so we really got to multiply everything by two when it comes to paint right because we need two coats all right so 1932 plus what else says walls wall base that makes it easy for us. Walls, walls, walls. Okay, so we have 1932 plus 37 equals times 2, right? Because we have to do two coats. Equals 3938 divided by 400. Because we're looking for how many gallons of paint we have to buy. And that's 9.8, so let's just say we need 10 gallons. Now, ceiling, and we're going to fix this because there is no deck. And we didn't do any prep, but we always assume the prep is done in our demo bid because we bid everything, so we don't put prep here. And I have to make sure when I say all, exclude all not indicated above, oh, Oh, good, I did. Prep is not included. Very good. All right, so ceiling. <clears throat> Same thing applies, right? We have 2016. 2016. Because that's all of our ceiling. Right? Double the 1,008. Okay? And divide by 400. Uh, that's 5.04, so we're going to be on the cheap side and just say 5. And then our doors... Right now, we can do door door frames, but we said the doors are 84. 84 plus, and then uh, we can do the the trim too for the window trim all together. So, uh, 84, 135, and we did wall base with something else in 60. So we add those two, three, 135 plus 84 plus 68 equals 287 times 2 equals 574 divided by 400, right? We're going to get two, two gallons for that. Just have a little extra. And we always want to add a lift and protection. And that is it, $4,202.25. We've added 5% overhead, 10% profit. Let's put that over here. Fix it, make it look all pretty. And <clears throat> we always spell check, automatically saves. But um, for this one, if, let's make it a little, oh, no, we don't want to make it too small. Okay. And then we uh, save it in a PDF. So to do this, we have to take the auto save off. File, save as, we go down here, PDF. We do it the old-fashioned way. And there it is. Nope, we got to make it smaller, you see. It didn't do it. <clears throat> it cut it off right there. So let's do it. We want to make it pretty. I think all of that will fit. There we go. Make that a little smaller, too. Let me save it because it's not auto-saving. And then, because we want to make sure when if they print it, you don't want that. They're like, ah, let's throw that in the trash. They don't want to format an Excel spreadsheet. Okay, good. There we go. 
all beautiful. All right, so <clears throat> that is a, we did the takeoff, uh, I think on another page or on another video, I'm not quite sure. But now this is the estimates. And remember for, uh, this is all, so we'll come back and do a an estimate for finishes. This, that wall paint, they, somehow they paint that gray for some reason. And uh, for your paint, you always, oh, we'll do a final cleaning one too. That's what that's for. So for your paint, you always want to look for your ceiling paint. Paint is always going to be your reflective ceiling plan. And then, you know, a good set of plans is going to give you interior elevations. Even This is a bad set of plans, and it gives me interior elevations, So. So you can measure accurately after you know that the plans are to scale and you can accurately measure uh, your heights, everything. And we just assume that we're going to paint behind all of the fixtures. We're not going to deduct that. But what we did deduct is, I probably have to go put it back because you can't really tell from here, is wall base. If the wall base... If the cabinetry has its own wall base or we use the wall base that it tells us for the flooring. But from here, see how there's nothing you can't really, it's just a bad set of plans. Well, that looks like something there, but then there's nothing there. It's like, okay, well, then there's something there. And if you're a good estimator, all these things uh, will concern you because you have to do accurate takeoff. So, but then you just, hey. It, let them know in writing what you didn't include in the estimate or what you did. So, all right, if you have any questions, make sure you contact us at education at sfjohnsonconsulting.com. Give me your thoughts on the presentation and please make sure to subscribe. See you next time. Hey, everyone, this is Stacy with SF Johnson Consulting and Construction Services, and let's talk about finishes so our finishes are anything that goes in and on uh, I like to say the project but anything that goes on the project or in the project or in the building after the main uh, structural components have been constructed and so drywall is a finish and that's the most odd finish I think roofing material is a finish and all the floor components are finishes. And so we want to go over this set of uh, construction documents for the Brunswick location because some of the finishes, you know, every set of plans, it's not great. And so, you know, just want to note some of the inconsistencies in the plans. And so the finish contractors will always want to look at the interior elevations and the finish plan. And so in the finished schedule, of course, uh, let's look at the finished schedule. And so the finished schedule is going to give us each of the rooms and tell us the floor finishes and the floor in the base and then all of the walls, north, south, east, west, and then the ceiling and then any remarks. And so we can basically, you know, been doing this forever, so I know I need to do... Uh, after I've done three of these, pretty much the same thing. Everything is sealed concrete, which I've chosen as epoxy. And uh, there are some things that are not clear. And so, you know, you have to make assumptions, but then note the assumptions in the estimate or just exclude what isn't clear. So the finished schedule. And so we go to the finished plan where we're going to make all of the measurements. And so we start here where we do all of the measurements for uh, the bases. Pretty much everything was a rubber base except for, I don't know why we did that different, except for uh, the bathrooms, uh, pretty much. And maybe I was doing some other, let me see, what is that blue for? Mm -hmm. Oh, closet paint. Okay, and so, too, if you're ever confused about, because here you can only do the lin how many linear feet, closet paint, but if you don't know the height, usually the reflective ceiling plan will give you the heights of the ceilings 
in every room. And let me see if I can find that real quick. A good reflective ceiling plan will give you the finish, which is, we can tell by the finish, this is very few uh, painted ceilings. So we know that the ceiling, even if, the, if there was no way to determine the height, uh, from anything else if there were like no section views or whatever just go to the reflective ceiling plan and then that's going to tell you the height of the ceiling so you figure you're going to paint the ceiling to the height right you're going to paint the I'm sorry you're going to paint the wall to the height of the ceiling and so you have to go through and do each thing individually because the height of the ceiling in the IT room is nine feet but then the uh, the restroom, we know we, we can exclude that because that is, uh, I think that is, uh, that's, we don't have to worry about that as far as the ceiling component because everything here is acoustical ceiling tile, but as far as the paint, the bathrooms are all tile and I believe that, but they give us interior elevation views for the bathroom, so we don't have to guess. But usually you have about three to four feet of wall that needs to be painted above any bathroom where they're like seven feet of if it's a nine foot it's probably six and a half feet of tile and the rest is paint but this one's pretty good because we get some interior elevation markers but again if you can't determine the height of the wall for your paint if it is painted you can always go to the reflective ceiling plan kind of got off on that one kind of so oh two finishes you're going to look at your door uh, schedule because you need to know and I uh, specifically marked uh, which doors I'm staining as opposed to the doors that I'm painting so if you're the finished person yeah interior elevations exterior elevations the door schedule and then if you are to paint the window frames you can use this to measure the lengths so that's good. Okay, so let's go back to finish schedule. So here's everything that we're going to do per room. And then all of the marks are uh, given to us here. RB is a rubber base, ACT, and all of ours is uh, two by two. So you know what each thing is, carpet, tile. We measure that by square yards instead of square feet. So you have to convert once you do the measurement, divide by nine, all of that. And so did all the measurements. So the epoxy was this area, all the concrete. Then we had the ceramic tile, was all of that area. And then we had carpet tile and the luxury vinyl over here and plywood now plywood is all of here but it didn't tell us that we're doing anything to the plywood so we just measured it there's because the plywood is just the flooring it didn't say we had to stain it anything so there's absolutely uh, nothing included for that including we did include the rubber base for that area yeah so the rubber base is included, but as far as the flooring, we didn't include anything because the plywood is just what the regular flooring floor is. Okay, and so that's that part. So that's all the interior. And then we always want to go back. So here, the interior elevations is going to give us all of what's on the wall based on the wall finish, interior elevation 401. If we look thir at 13, it's the finishes on this wall, 12 finishes along this wall, 14, and so on and so forth. So, if is for future reference, if you're looking at the finish schedule and there's a room like this room with no interior elevation, uh, that I'll exclude it because that probably means there's nothing that's going to be done, but then you go to the finish schedule. And that is the mezzanine, and I believe they don't even give this a name, so we don't even know what that is. So is it a good set of plans saying just ignore it, or is it a bad set of plans? We had to do something, 
but it didn't tell us what to do. So I just left that alone, only gave it the, uh, the base, no finishes on the plywood floor. Okay, and so you got the doors, you got to see how many you have to paint, and then you want to look at your exterior elevations. And so here's the outside of the building. So you kind of want to know, okay, is there a finish I need to be aware of? So quickly, I know that the metal panel for this building is excluded as far as what we need to do. So we've excluded that brick veneer, new paint. So we would give that a square footage for we have to paint the brick. So everywhere we saw a new paint, we measured that and we applied that uh, to the estimate new lights that be on the uh, electrical. You don't have to it's just pointing it out. Canopy roof existing so nothing here but we did uh, set a cost to paint the gutter systems. All existing and all new. And yeah. So but Everything here was marked. See C's and D's and Y's, but in the areas that there were no marks, we did not apply any kind of finish. We didn't put anything as far. So all of this, there is no cause for painting for anything other than the doors. So that should be noted. Okay, because there were no marks here assumed it may be by mistake but everything here is excluded if the mark isn't there then we just excluded it because it's too confusing to try to figure out okay is this the same as this is no because the texture see it's a different type of finish so that's not the same and that's the roof it's not the wall and so, yeah, all that gray has been excluded in terms of is there any paint, any kind of finish, any cleaning, anything. So, it's just better safe than sorry because that would really incre increase the cost for not really sure if we're doing anything. Then it can be clarified later. But everything that is marked, there is a cost. These are all the downspouts and all the gutters. And so, in terms of finishes, you know, you want to look at the finish schedule, which we did. Look at the um, finish plan. Interior, why there's no labor. This includes material and labor in that one price per square foot. And then the other items for the finishes. So, we added the coffee bar and placing chairs and the refrigerator and couple of other things, the bathroom, grab bars, and all of that. And then the end of the day, before uh, overhead profit, not too bad. So if you have any questions, please email me directly at education at sfjohnsonconsulting.com. Tell me what you think. And uh, this is the last video for today, which is the 14th of November. But for today, uh, the remainder of the week, there'll be a ton more to go over each of the takeoffs and the estimates to clarify anything and to give you tips and hopefully help you become an excellent estimator. Never rush anything. That's what I've learned over these years. But... Let me give me your thoughts, and uh, I will see you on the next video. A couple of definitions here, and what is electrocution? And it is the result when a person is exposed to a lethal amount of electrical energy. And so, as far as uh, OSHA is concerned, we've broken those down into a number of different hazards, and just want to go over each and just some basic stuff. Remember, if you are a subscriber, we are going to um, have our OSHA certification for our subscribers beginning in January, meeting an hour plus a little every Saturday in the afternoon. And if you attend, I got to make sure you attend. You are there. Uh, you sign on 
all that good stuff. And then this will be part of your training too. This is part of the focus or fatal for uh, falls, struck bys, uh, electrocution, uh, caught in between. And those are, you know, the things that we uh, study. So. So burns, electrocution, shocks, arc, flash, blast, fires, and explosions. And one of the, the terms that they use for electrical is to be safe. And each of the letters uh, in be safe stands for something. And so burns, the burns are the most common shock-related injuries. Okay, from electricity, one of the three types. So there are three types of burns, electrical, arc, flash, and thermal contact. Electrocution is the E. It can be fatal. It means it, it can kill you. Electrocution results when a human is exposed to a lethal amount of electricity, which you can be if you're messing around uh, up high and you're not within a approved uh, distance from uh, power lines. I mean, you could kill yourself. So many people have. Shocks. Shocks result when the body becomes a part of the electrical circuit. And we've all done that once or twice in our life. Being dumb and listening to my brother, right? You do stupid stuff. Uh, arc flash blast. And arc flash is a sudden release of electrical energy through the air. Okay, when a high voltage gap exists, you don't want to be uh, there. Okay? Fire. Okay? We, uh... You know, electricians set stuff on fire when they don't use the proper wiring or breakers or whatever. So, these are all things. And then, of course, explosions. And then, you know, there's some statistics. Okay, 9% of 1,200 pretty much deaths based on these things that we've spoken about. Okay, and so the type of hazards that you just want to be, if you're in this field, okay, power lines that's the, that's the biggest thing okay and so OSHA states that you have to be uh, anywhere from 15 to 25 feet 10, 10 to 25 feet away depending on the voltage of that uh, power line okay and so if you're working in those kinds of conditions right you have to have a specialized hel hat helmet uh, gloves everything when you're dealing with those kinds of situations. But yeah, that is the biggest uh, and the most profound hazard. When we come in contact with power lines as the electrician. Okay, and now second, uh, energized sources. So that's why it's so important to understand the uh, lockout, tag out procedures and when it is okay to approach a piece of equipment and make sure things are de-energized before you work on them. Okay, and proper use of extension cords on the job site. You know, these are the three most uh, considered hazards uh, for the electrician. But again, please, please, please subscribe so you can be a part of our full OSHA training okay our full training and uh, these are just some basic things if you're if you're in the field hey these are some things you need to be watching out for you know distances you need to make sure you uh, are mindful of and let's just watch this cute little OSHA video job with over 700 fatalities just in the year 2000 in the U.S., hundreds of construction workers die every year while on the job, with over 700 fatalities just in the year 2011. The third leading cause of these deaths is electrocution. Electrocutions cause one of every 10 construction worker deaths, with nearly 70 deaths in 2011. But these deaths can be prevented. The video you're about to see shows how quickly contact with overhead power lines can result in the electrocution of a worker. The video will also show what employers must do to ensure that the work can be done more safely. Employers have a responsibility to provide a safe workplace and protect workers against possible hazards. You'll see that training workers, pre-job planning, and taking the right precautions save lives.
Please be advised, the scenes you're about to see deal with deaths at construction sites and may be disturbing to some people. All scenes are based on actual events. Two construction workers were replacing a section of pipe in a trench next to a road. They were using a crane to unload the pipe from a truck and place it on the ground close to the trench. While one worker operated the crane, another worker was on the ground to help direct the pipe toward the ground near the trench. The worker directing the pipe had one hand on the tagline, which was attached to the rigging used to lift the load. As the crane operator began to move the pipe, the crane's boom contacted an overhead power line. The electrical current traveled through the boom, down the load line, along the tagline, and reached the worker. He died instantly. Let's look at the events leading up to this tragic incident and see how it could have been prevented. The worksite did not have many of the required controls in place to protect workers from overhead power line hazards. For instance, before the work started, the employer had not set up the required clearance distance to keep the crane a safe distance from the overhead power line. Let's take a look at the same work area, this time with proper precautions in place. All workers are trained. This includes the crane operator being certified and the rigger and spotter fully qualified. Because the line is live or energized, the employer has taken steps to keep a safe distance from the power line. The foreman obtained the voltage of the overhead power line from the utility company. Based on the voltage, he determined the minimum required distance of the crane from the power line. A pre-job safety planning meeting was held. Flags are set up to show the boundary that must not be crossed. A non-conductive tagline is used to control the movement of the pipes. The truck is no longer directly below the power line. And a spotter is on site with a two-way radio to communicate with the operator. Higher voltage lines will require greater minimum safe distances and additional precautions than those shown here. Now, as the pipe is moved, the boom remains a safe distance from the power lines and the worker safely guides the pipe towards the ground near the trench. This video shows one of several options employers can use to keep workers safe when operating cranes near power lines. Not all work sites are the same, and the precautions could be different than those shown here. Construction deaths from electrocutions are preventable. The precautions shown here save workers' lives. Follow safe crane operation requirements on the job. It could be the difference between life and death. If you'd like more information, contact OSHA at www.osha.gov or 1-800-321. Make sure you sign up, make sure you subscribe, sign up with us so you can attend our certified training. Um, OSHA 10 is what we're offering for all of our subscribers. It is a live class. You do have to be live uh, with us when we perform the class. It'll be on Saturdays in the afternoon. The, I think it's uh, 2 for 1 or 12 or something. Uh, I forget. Pacific time and, you know, sign up. If you do this work, not only are, if you're an electrician, right, from this video, you can just get caught up and get electrocuted. So. We don't want that to happen. Knowledge is power, and we hope that you will join us. And uh, remember, Sunday on the 4th of December tomorrow, we will have live uh, music all day, music for contractors all day. So while you're cleaning your truck, cleaning your tools, getting all your vest all clean, cleaning your fingernails, <laughs> you can be listening to some kickback. So... Have a good rest of the evening. I will see you on Sunday.
Thank <laughs> you. 